tell the pilot get the chopper ready to take me to Abu Dhabi F1 Grand Prix. My driver already waiting with my Rolls Royce and some bad bitches in my Ferrari too. Hashtag Abu Dhabi Grand Prix. Hashtag Dubai. One thing that sets the Lazarus Group apart from other hackers is the motivation behind their alleged crimes. They're operating under orders from their government to fill the coffers of a nation state. By contrast, for some of the partners in crime they find in the dark web underworld, the motivation is something else entirely, personal greed. It's a different type of standard when you start hopping out of Rolls Royce to catch a jet, just to attend fashion shows in a different continent. Your smile begins to be bright just as the sun. Hashtag private jet, hashtag fashion, hashtag Paris. What you're hearing there are Instagram posts from one of the internet's most outrageous fraudsters, a big flashy character and a colleague of the Lazarus Group's dark web accomplice, Big Boss. The Lazarus Group's ambition, the sheer scale of the thefts they're accused of attempting, made them very attractive partners for dark web criminals looking to get rich quick. No matter what you do in life, always upgrade and update. Hashtag Ferrari, hashtag Rolls Royce, Hashtag Bentley. And now it's time to tell you the tale of two big league online crooks who partnered up with Lazarus Group and lived to regret it. It's a tangled tale full of ill-gotten gains and Instagram glamour, Lamborghinis, Louis Vuitton, and piles and piles of stolen cash. Much of it, investigators say, profits from North Korea's criminal exploits. And it's a story that comes crashing down at one of the world's most exclusive hotels. I didn't know exactly what he did. I knew he had money. The lifestyle was a lot, you know, but it's Dubai. Everybody there is rich. From the BBC World Service, this is The Lazarus Heist, season two. I'm Jean Lee. And I'm Jeff White. Episode three, Hush Puppy. We knew that something was up, everyone felt that something was up. At first we thought it was a glitch. Malta, a tiny island nation just south of Italy, slap bang in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. Famous for beautiful Baroque palaces and churches, and also its beaches and laid back atmosphere. But on the chilly evening of Wednesday 13th of February 2019, the serenity is punctured by something pretty unsettling. It was a time when people are leaving from work, and going to run the couple of errands that they have to run before going home. We started getting the first reports from the supermarkets that they were finding that the systems were not working. Abigail Mamo is the chief executive of Malta's Chamber of Small and Medium Enterprises. That means she looks out for the interests of the island's restaurants, cafes, mom and pop corner shops. So when credit card machines stop working in grocery stores, on a day when people are buying last-minute Valentine's Day chocolates, Abigail's phone begins to ring. And there were a lot of apologies from the um, cashiers and the, the managers. They told shoppers to go and withdraw money from the ATMs, which also obviously did not work. At first, they thought that maybe the card is not working, maybe the internet is down, maybe the ATM is, is not functioning, which is something that things that happen. Then it transpired that the problem is a bigger one. Much bigger, in fact. It's chaos. Shoppers abandon carts and baskets full of food because they can't use their credit cards or get cash. And Abigail keeps hearing more and more reports from all kinds of shops and businesses right across the island. It was very frustrating and very confusing. Panicked shopkeepers began looking for help, and they turned to one of the island's oldest and largest financial institutions, the Bank of Valletta. So Bank of Valletta is a very big business in Malta. It is um, quite unlikely that you would find someone who does not bank with Bank of Valletta in one way or another. It is a major player in Malta. Soon enough, Bank of Valletta confirms what you've probably guessed. It was a massive cyber attack. Being a small island, and we think that we will not be of any interest to international crime and things like that. And obviously, a cyber attack was on no one's radar. But that's just the nature of the Lazarus Group's relentless international operation. They're not bound by geography. 
Their scope is global, and even tiny, unsuspecting Malta is in their sights. The hack starts with the classic tactic, a phishing email. Messages arrive at Bank of Valletta, which, at first glance, look like they come from the French Financial Markets Authority. In fact, the hackers had set up a different email address that looked extremely similar to the real one. They only need to fool one Bank of Valletta employee into clicking the link or opening the attachment, and their virus is soon spreading inside the bank's networks. Here's where things get interesting for you ardent Lazarus Group watchers. You might think they'd carry on with their new ATM jackpotting technique. After all, it worked at Cosmos Bank in India. But for the Maltese job, the hackers switched tactics. We can't reach the hackers to ask them why, but I'm going to guess that they were put off by the staggering logistics involved in jackpotting. That's right. I mean, think about it. After the cash point attacks, there were hundreds of mules reporting to dozens of handlers running around with bags full of cash worth millions of dollars. Getting their cut of that money could be a big headache for the hackers. So for the Bank of Valletta job, they go back to their trademark, tried and tested method of attack, the one they're world famous for, using the SWIFT system. Back in season one, you'll remember that the Lazarus Group hacked into the SWIFT network for the Bangladesh bank job. SWIFT is a messaging system that financial institutions around the world use to send transfers to each other. Once the hackers get inside the Bank of Valletta's network, they snake their way to the bank's internal SWIFT software and use it to send money directly to accounts they have control over, right from under the bank's nose. It sounds so much cleaner and neater, doesn't it, compared to the ATM jackpotting? You've not got money mules or handlers, there's no need to track and recoup all those banknotes. In fact, actually, here's a detail we haven't told you about yet. Remember in the last episode we said the total sum stolen from Cosmos Bank after the ATM raid was about 14 million US dollars? Well, only 12 million of that came from the cash points. The other 2 million was stolen using SWIFT. Maybe once the hackers had done the ATM job, they thought, hell, why not see if we can send a few SWIFT transfers too? But the hackers discover there's a major drawback to SWIFT. Remember, in the Bangladesh bank heist, the hackers tried sending SWIFT transfers for just over a billion US dollars, but a tiny mistake by the hackers led the bank to catch on quickly enough to cancel and reverse most of those transfers. And actually, a similar thing happened with the Cosmos Bank SWIFT scheme. Cosmos managed to trace and stop about half of the two million US dollars of SWIFT transfers. So when it comes to the 2019 raid on the Bank of Valletta in Malta, the Lazarus Group faces a challenge. Maybe they want to use SWIFT to avoid the logistical headaches of a jackpotting job, but they also need to ensure that their SWIFT transfers don't get tracked and stopped. The hackers are going to need help to pull this off cleanly, and they know exactly where to turn for it. The same dark web accomplice who helped them with the Cosmos heist, Big Boss. What the Lazarus Group hackers need for their Bank of Valletta job are bank accounts they can transfer the stolen money into, what criminals call drop accounts. They usually set up under a fake ID or some other false pretense, and the crooks controlling them are experts in moving money so that it can't be clawed back by investigators. Big Boss doesn't just run mule networks and provide cloned credit cards. He can also offer drop accounts. And it turns out he's not working alone. He's got someone helping him with this service. Brother, sup, bro? This trusted friend goes by the alias Hush Puppy. Not sure why, the first thing that comes to my mind are those delicious nuggets of deep fried cornmeal called Hush Puppies. It's a Southern American snack. I've never had one. But look, however he got the name, Hush Puppy's got a long history with Big Boss. It's very probable these two never met in real life. They may have no idea about each other's real identity or even location. That's just how it goes down in the cybercrime underground. But that hasn't stopped them working together on plenty of jobs. They're brothers, all right, brothers in crime. So in January 2019, a month before the raid on the Bank of Valletta, Big Boss lets Hush Puppy in on the plan to take the bank for all they can get. 12 February, they're doing it. My associates want you to clear as soon as it hits. If they don't notice, we keep pumping. Just to translate, Big Boss's associates want Hush Puppy to launder and hide the money as soon as it goes in to the drop accounts. And if Bank of Valletta doesn't catch on, the hackers are going to keep transferring more money. And Big Boss's associates, according to investigators, are the Lazarus Group. But again, it's likely Big Boss and Hush Puppy don't know that. 
No one gives their real name on the dark web. It's kind of crazy to think that Big Boss and Hush Puppy are assisting an alleged North Korean state hacking operation when it's entirely possible they can't even find the place on a map. All they know is that they've been promised a huge payout. And on the cyber criminal underground, you don't ask too many questions. Big Boss tells Hush Puppy he needs drop accounts that can launder as much as 5 million euros each without setting off alarm bells. Hush Puppy replies with the details of an account at a Romanian bank that's primed and ready. But Big Boss thinks one account won't be enough to handle the haul. He demands four accounts, or spots as he calls them. I have four spots available. You gave me one. Try to get me a next one, please. As the deadline nears, the pressure grows. Without these drop accounts, the hackers won't be able to max out on the heist. Big Boss keeps pushing. Brother, tonight is my deadline to submit anything more. Do you want to add one more or just stick to the one that you gave me? Hush Puppy comes through just in time. He gives Big Boss details of another drop account, this time in Bulgaria. On that Wednesday in February 2019, the hackers spring into action inside the Bank of Valletta. Big Boss and Hush Puppy are seeing their drop accounts fill up with cash. Wire is completed. We did it. By the end of that first day, the Bank of Valletta still hasn't worked out what's going on. We still have access and they didn't realize. We're gonna shoot again tomorrow, AM. And then it all comes to a screeching halt. Someone inside the Bank of Valletta realizes they've been compromised and they just shut down their systems. That's what causes the chaos at shops across Malta. The bank then releases a statement to customers and the press saying they're under attack. Meanwhile, Big Boss texts Hush Puppy with a screen grab of the headlines. Look, it hit the news. Damn. Too bad they caught on or it would have been a nice payout. Nonetheless, it's a good run for Big Boss and Hush Puppy. The hackers steal 13 million euros from Banca Valletta. It's worth almost 15 million US dollars at the time. Now, we don't know for sure how much Big Boss and Hush Puppy would have got as a fee for all this, but money launderers traditionally take a big percentage. I'm guessing Big Boss and Hush Puppy were probably banking on more lucrative collaborations with these clever hackers. But in the meantime, they've got a bunch of other shady schemes in the works. That's right. A few months after the Bank of Valletta hack, Big Boss and Hush Puppy are working on another job together, totally unrelated to North Korea. This time, they're scamming an American law firm out of almost a million dollars. And as the fraud goes down, Big Boss is on a flight to Atlanta, Georgia, in the US. When he gets off the plane, he finds text messages from Hush Puppy, hassling him for confirmation that the law firm jobs come off. Sup, bro? Landed. Just now. Money came in? Yes. Give me a screenshot. Big Boss tells him to hang tight. He'll send the screenshot of the money sitting in their drop account just as soon as he gets a strong enough signal. So Hush Puppy waits. And waits. But that text never arrives because, unbeknownst to Hush Puppy, just after sending that last message, Big Boss is arrested at the airport. His real identity and his whole criminal backstory is about to be exposed. And pretty soon, both he and Hush Puppy will wish they never got involved with the Lazarus Group. Big Boss may have been stunned to find himself in handcuffs in Atlanta airport in 2019, but in fact, He'd been on law enforcement's radar for a long time, and it was all thanks to a lucky break years before he ever got involved with the Lazarus Group. In 2017, police were investigating a small gang that specialized in stealing the personal information of wealthy bank customers. So armed with this information, these guys would walk into a bank and impersonate the customers and then withdraw large sums of their money. One of the guys they used to pull this off must have been a pretty good actor because none of the gang caught on to the fact that he was also an informant for the US Secret Service. Thanks to evidence from their undercover source, the police move in and arrest a few members of the gang. During the investigation, the Secret Service pick up phone calls to a member living in Canada. Now this guy seems to be calling the shots. He's booking flights, reserving hotels, making sure everything runs like clockwork. He seems to be the gang's boss, the big boss. In fact, it was our big boss, the same one who goes on to launder millions of dollars for the North Koreans. And by sheer fluke, US law enforcement have stumbled across him. They start monitoring him, and when he finally flies into their jurisdiction in October 2019, 
They nab him at the airport. Beautiful. Big Boss is unmasked. This shadowy dark web facilitator who marshaled the teams of money mules for the Cosmos jackpotting raid, who helped clone the ATM cards, who helped move millions from the Bank of Valletta, was, in fact... The money launderer, Galab Alamari, who is being prosecuted by my office and is in custody in the Southern District of Georgia. Galab Alamari, a.k.a. Big Boss, a.k.a. Backwood, a.k.a. Habibi, He's a 36-year-old Canadian. I'm looking at his mugshot. He has on a plain black T-shirt, and he's pretty neatly groomed. He's got short, dark hair, a very well-trimmed mustache and goatee, and a slight five o'clock shadow. Alamari conspired to steal and then launder tens of millions of dollars for the North Koreans and other criminals. This is Tracy Wilkerson part of the Department of Justice team chasing the Lazarus Group hackers and their accomplices. The team reveals their criminal case against Alamari in a virtual press conference. And they say that just two months after the Cosmos attack, the Lazarus Group used Big Boss's services for another ATM jackpotting raid, this time on a bank in Pakistan, where they got away with 6.1 million U.S. dollars in just 23 minutes, thanks in part to Ghalib's network of money mules. Cyber attack, Alami payment scheme, or Rakam Hasil Karnevale Bank Parhua, Satais October. I've been doing a lot of digging into Galeb's background. It's an intriguing story. It seems he was born into quite a well to do family of business people in Quebec. I'm looking at pictures of a grand house the family rent out in Montreal. It's an amazing place. Eight bedrooms, heated pool. The garden leads right into a beautiful park next door. But it seems things went off the rails for Galeb as he grew up. I spoke to one of his former business associates. He didn't want to go on tape, but he told me how Galeb got caught up in financial crime from a young age, getting in deeper and deeper. And we found Canadian court records which back that up. He was convicted of theft, possession of fake credit cards, fraud, got several fines, periods of probation. You can see Galeb growing in confidence through this time. His old workmate told me Galeb was always into computers, and it seems it wasn't too big a switch to move from card fraud into cybercrime. So, Galeb sets himself up on the dark web as Big Boss and, well, you know the rest. We also spoke to Galeb's father, a businessman. He didn't want to be recorded or go on the record. But our conversation echoed what he has told the Canadian media. He says, young people can be blinded by people who offer them ways to make money. And he says that he still supports him. Your son is still your son. His dad believes Galeb was not in fact the Big Boss in this conspiracy that there were more influential people involved. I took that to mean hush puppy. And Galeb's dad isn't the only one looking at Galeb's long-standing accomplice. When Galeb is arrested, police quickly discover suspicious correspondence with a contact saved in his phone as hush. And to find the real world identity of this guy, the police don't need phone taps, undercover informants, or any high-tech decryption software. All they need to do is look at Instagram. In the days I used to wear Versace, only Versace had made Louboutins famous in Nigeria. Police connect the phone numbers, email addresses, and Snapchat accounts that Galeb has for Hush with an Instagram account with the username Hushpuppy. But this isn't just a friends and family thing. It turns out Hushpuppy is a Nigerian influencer with 2.3 million followers. Here he is bragging about his collection of shoes by the designer Christian Louboutin. One pair alone can cost thousands of dollars. But almost every collection in every colors that they made Louboutins, everything, I even have personalized Louboutins in my name. I have to be honest, it is fun to check out his Instagram account. I mean, he is a walking fashion show. Fendi shirts, Birkin bags in every shade, a purple Versace dressing gown emblazoned with hush puppy on the back. He's bathing in infinity pools, flying to Paris on a jet. He's got a Louis Vuitton blanket to match his Louis Vuitton outfit. And he's lounging on a fire engine red Ferrari dressed from head to toe in Gucci. I didn't recognize any of the brands of clothing, but the thing I noticed about his Instagram account was that in almost every single one of his 400 or so photos, he's on his own. He's surrounded by these purchases, all these shopping bags, but he's all alone. I actually found that oddly bleak. We wanted to know more, of course, about this man who did so much to help the North Korean hackers with their schemes, and we finally tracked down someone who spent a lot of time with him, a friend 
and a fellow Nigerian Instagram star, Olukoya Abisoye. In fact, those clips you heard of Hosh Puppy bragging about his shoes, they come from an interview Olukoya recorded with him for his own Instagram followers. OK, um, yeah, my yeah. name is Olukoya Abisoye. Um, a lot of people call me Oye Mike. Social media influencer, creative. Um, I have a beard gear company and I have a clothing line company called Balloon Flex. So yeah, that's what I do and I'm crazy. <laughs> As you can probably hear, Olukoya is a hive of energy. He's based in London, so I got to meet him in person. He's tall, with dreadlocks, a big beard. And when we meet, he's wearing this vivid multicoloured denim jacket. I wish I could pull that look off. We got to talking about what it's like to be a Nigerian influencer on social media. You have to understand being Nigerian, first of all, we don't have it easy. You know, you have to fight for everything you have. And we say there that Nigerian social media space should be on Netflix. There's a lot of bullies. So, you know, I had to grow thick skin. These guys generate plenty of headlines for Nigeria's TV and newspapers. And Hosh Puppy was one of this world's biggest. He attracted a whirlwind of gossip, backbiting and one-upmanship, among other celebs. So when Olukoya first gets a message of praise from Hush Puppy on Instagram, he's excited to connect with this social media superstar. I'm like, bro, I love what you do too. I mean, I like, I'm like. i hoping one day I'm able to dress like that. That's why I'm asking, what can I do? Because I know he's an influencer. He might influence that job to make yeah. <laughs> some money myself. Yeah. So so obviously he's, he's got a lot of money. Did he tell you where that money was coming from? What was your um, thought? To be him? really honest, I didn't know. Hmm. I didn't know exactly what he did. I knew he had money. Uh, now, the lifestyle was a lot, you know, but it's Dubai. Everybody there is rich. What do you say about his sort of childhood, his background, his upbringing, you know, the early, early life? Did you get any sense of that? I never asked. We never had um, mm. those conversations. But I knew he was from trenches like I am, mm. from the ghetto. In interviews Hush Puppy gave to fellow influencers and YouTubers, he tells the story of his rise from humble beginnings. Raised in a rough part of Lagos, he says his father was a taxi driver, his mother sold bread. But by the time Olukoya befriends him, Hush Puppy is living in one of the world's most glamorous hotels, the Palazzo Versace in Dubai. He's got the full Versace treatment. Everything in his apartment is branded with the Versace logo, from coffee cups to trash cans. So when Hush Puppy invites Olukoya over to Dubai for a visit, he doesn't think twice. The hotel, the Palazzo Versace yeah, Hotel. Yeah. What is that like? Oh, beautiful. Mm. Stunning. I was amazed. I had never been in that sort of environment. The mm. food, oh, I'm tasting it. You know, it was adorable. I enjoyed myself. Did you sleep over, by the way? Oh, there? and I slept well. I had a great dream. I had never dreamt like that. I mean, I made a video the next morning. It's online. I'm like, I woke up on Versace bed. <laughs> Don't talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> These opulent surroundings are just about to become the site of a crime scene investigation. Unknown to Olukoya and to Hush Puppy's millions of adoring fans, Hush is leading a double life, a secret life of crime, and that's about to crash into the high rolling world of the Palazzo Versace. My name is Nadim, and I used to work for Palazzo Versace in the time where, uh, when uh, Hush Puppy was still a resident of our hotel. The Palazzo Versace Hotel didn't want to talk to us about their former resident, so I went through the LinkedIn profiles of every former staff member I could find to see if any of them would speak. 732 profiles later, I ended up talking to Nadim Maduyanin, former assistant chief concierge at the hotel, now living back in his native Montenegro. We were in charge of uh, arranging everything that the guests needs. People like to rent Lamborghinis, uh, Bentleys, Rolls Royces. Yachts and there was a lot of people with a lot of money, yeah. He called himself Hush Puppy on social media. In the hotel, was he sort of known as Hush Puppy? He was, yes. Yes, that is correct. We, nobody knew his real name. If you see him for the first time, you would never in your life, you would have no idea that he did what he did, actually. He was so like an ordinary person, you know. He was not even showing off in a, in a hotel lobby. He was just normal, like flip-flops. Uh, pajamas, like really just a normal person. As far as I know, he never ever tipped any of my boys from the belt team. Oh, really? Uh, one penny. And they did a lot of things for him, like move this, move that. Yeah, I promise you. Oh, 
It was crazy. So did that affect how people felt about him then? Because Not really, because he was always nice to everyone. He was always friendly and, you know, he would always stop by and talk to you for a couple of minutes. Before I knew who he really was, I would never imagine in my life that he was capable of doing what he did. It's just ridiculous, you know, he's a, he's a pretty damn good actor. <laughs> After arresting Big Boss in Atlanta, it didn't take long for U.S. law enforcement to amass enough evidence on Hush Puppy as well. And of course, they had no problem figuring out his location because he was broadcasting it on Instagram. So they asked authorities in Dubai to keep a close watch on the comings and goings at the Palazzo Versace. And in June 2020, Dubai police make their move. I remember the day and a close friend of mine, he used to work as a security there. And he opened the door with the master key to his apartment when the police came. No way. And then the police just boom, you know, like, ah, police, ah, 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 hands in the air. <laughs> it was, it was, it was really like in the movies. It was really like in the movies. So much like a movie, in fact, that Dubai police later released a glitzy film of what they call Operation Fox Hunt 2. Dubai e-police teams were tracking his every move and taking note of all his social media activities. It's an absolutely incredible video, and if you've got a spare five minutes, I highly recommend you watch it. Graphics, slow-mo, moody reconstructions, it's basically a cross between CSI Dubai and a Fast and Furious movie. In the operation, police officers were also able to seize 21 computers, 47 smartphones, 15 storage memory devices, and five hard disks. There's even a sweeping Steadicam shot of Hush Puppy's fleet of 13 luxury cars. It was Bentleys, Mercedes, the Jeeps. They found over $100,000 cash under his mattress in his apartment. This is ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, and now we've got this whole story. I mean, have you been, been aware that not only has he been arrested, well, actually convicted for cyber crimes, but there seems to be there's a connection to North Korea as well? No way! That's right, yes. Well, that's why we're investigating no it. No way! Wow. The world finally learns the real name of the high-flying playboy known as Hush Puppy, Ramon Abbas. His arrest is greeted with a certain amount of schadenfreude by some celebrities, rappers, and gossip columnists in Nigeria. Many of them had already speculated that Hush Puppy was a Yahoo boy. This is slang for a fraudster who sends those infamous Nigerian prince emails from an old-school Yahoo email account. We've all received them. His downfall even inspires songs like this one by the Nigerian Afrobeat star Voices Banor called They Will Catch You. Gotta warn you, it's a bit of an earworm. As for Alu Koya, he's got conflicted feelings now about the man who inspired him and did so much for his own social media career. I think if he's really guilty of it, then I hope that the court of law and the police do what they think is right. But I didn't know him in that way. Mm. You know, I, I didn't know a bad person. I just saw a guy who liked what I did and showed me love. Now, I'm not with what he had done. I'm just saying that I mm. didn't know that part, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. This is one of the things I find interesting about Hush Puppy as a character is that he had this entire life above the water, wearing these amazing clothes, having this amazing lifestyle. And there's a whole hidden side of his life that he kept secret from you, he kept secret, tried to keep secret from the authorities. It's amazing that, that you can run those two things, that you can be so out there and very, so visible. That's very easy, though. Mm. It's very easy. You think? Because, yeah, human beings, we are all actors. You have to understand that. <laughs> I could tell you that I have a clothing line. And after I leave here, I'm going to rob a bank. Mm. The truth is, you wouldn't know. You mm. could be a journalist here now, and when you get home, you do some other stuff. How would you know? Mm. That's the truth, until one day you get caught. For Hush Puppy, a.k.a. Ramon Abbas, there's no more posing for selfies, no more extravagant shopping trips, no more exciting double life. Hush Puppy is extradited to the United States, and he pleads guilty to conspiring to engage in money laundering, and he gets an 11-year prison sentence. Big Boss, a.k.a. Galib Alamawi, also pleads guilty. 
He's sentenced to 11 years, eight months for multiple offences, including laundering funds from alleged North Korean bank heists. US authorities now have two of North Korea's key accomplices behind bars. But what of the real big bosses, the Lazarus Group? Well, remember that press conference we heard a clip of earlier, unveiling the charges against Ghalib? His case wasn't actually the main event that day. These actors are not uh, as anonymous as they think they are. As you see in this uh, indictment, you can see photos of the um, hackers at issue. You think you're anonymous behind a keyboard, but you're not. It's February 2021. The FBI, the Secret Service, and the Department of Justice have gathered to make a big announcement. This is John Demers. He was then an assistant U.S. Attorney General. He's announcing explosive new charges, not just against Kalab Alamari, but also against three suspected Lazarus Group hackers. And we lay out uh, how we can prove uh, that uh, attribution, again, not to a nation state level, not even to a unit level within a military or an intelligence organization, but to the individual uh, hacker. Arrest warrants have been issued in, in the federal court in Los Angeles for three defendants. John Chang Hyuk, Kim Il, and Park Jin Hyuk. They are considered fugitives from justice. Please know that when we assign attribution to a particular cyber aggressor, we do so with high confidence while relying on very solid evidence. John Chang Hyuk, Kim Il, Park Jin Hyuk. The names are revealed by Christy Johnson. She was then assistant director of the FBI's L.A. field office. You might recognize one of the names, Park Jin Hyuk. He's the man the U.S. government claims is a key player in the cyber crimes we told you about in season one. Well, at this press conference, investigators bring new allegations against Park Jin Hyuk and unveil the identities of those two additional suspects they say are his North Korean comrades in cybercrime. U.S. and South Korean authorities estimate that North Korea has up to 7,000 trained hackers. So far, the U.S. Department of Justice has only ever named these three. They charge the group again with the Sony attack, the Bangladesh heist, WannaCry, and add new allegations about their ATM jackpotting scheme and other cyber attacks. North Korea, of course, continues to deny all these allegations. Just as they did with Pak Jin Hyok, the FBI release wanted posters of the two new alleged hackers. And it's the photo of Kim Il we want to focus on. Because authorities suggest it was he who recruited Big Boss for the Cosmos and Banker Valletta raids. And through him, Hush Puppy. I'm looking at his picture. It might be a passport photo. So he's wearing a blue shirt and a sweater vest. He's got a stylish mop of spiky hair and a little smirk on his face. I think he wouldn't look out of place in a K-pop band. He looks so young. U.S. authorities claim Kim was born in 1994. That would make him in his late 20s now, but only 24 at the time of the Cosmos attack. But according to accusations against him, this baby-faced computer whiz has already lived an extraordinary life, especially for a North Korean. The authorities say Kim Il has lived in Russia and Singapore. Like Pat Jin Hyok, it seems he was dispatched aboard by the regime. They also say he speaks Chinese and English, which would be handy for making connections with accomplices on the dark web. Despite the staggering range of charges in their indictment against these three alleged hackers, there's almost no prospect of them being arrested. All of them are believed to be back in North Korea. I expect they won't be traveling here anytime soon, although I wish they would so we could prove all these charges in court. Still, John Demers makes clear that the charges are intended to raise awareness of their crimes. And of course to reveal their strategy of targeting Lazarus Group activities by bringing down their international network of accomplices. Good afternoon. My name is Jesse Baker. That's J-E-S-S-E -S -S -E Baker. It's my honor to represent the Secret Service here today. We continue to see a confluence of state and non-state actors in cybercrime. Oftentimes, it's, it's no longer either criminal groups or nation states. These distinctions have really blurred. Blurred to the point where a North Korean government hacker can go into an underground crime forum and find a global network of money mules and money launderers for cyber attacks on banks in India, Malta, and more. Just like I might go online to find someone to deliver flowers to Jeff for his birthday, or commission a moving company to help schlep some furniture across town. With Big Boss and Hush Puppy behind bars, the Lazarus Group's lost two of their trusted accomplices. 
Is that going to hurt future operations? Someone well placed to know is Mike DeBolt of tech security firm Intel 471, who tracked Big Boss's online activity for us. In fact, he managed to find traces of him online right up until he got caught. So there was two or three aliases that we saw go offline and remain offline as of t September 2019. And he was reportedly arrested in October 2019. So we ask Mike if he thinks the group will have a hard time replacing Big Boss. That's an interesting question. Uh, so the, the ultimate goal for sort of countering cybercrime is putting people in handcuffs. It's the holy grail of what we do. But there's always going to be somebody that replaces Olimari and the services that he provides. It's kind of a dime or a dozen, um, really, in the cybercrime underground. So for the North Korean actors to sort of replicate what they've done in the past and find another service provider to do it, it would be a little bit of a heartache. But, you know, it's kind of a bump in the road, I guess, more so than it is a severe decapitation of their ability to conduct further attacks. In other words, the Lazarus Group is still on the march. Their money minions and dark web associates get arrested, their top hackers get unmasked and indicted, but still their hacking attacks mount up. And so do the tens of millions of dollars they can manage without the likes of Big Boss. And that's because he never really was the Big Boss. The Lazarus Group is allegedly acting under a much bigger boss, Kim Jong-un, and as the big boss of the North Korean regime, it's hard at the top. He has a lot of hurdles ahead in his goal to make his country a nuclear superpower. It's not just as simple as sitting back and letting the hacking funds flow in. Every advancement in his weapons program provokes a response from the West that leaves his country more isolated and more economically imperiled. Next time on The Lazarus Heist, I want to tell you the story of arguably the most tumultuous and pivotal year in Kim Jong-un's career. He made breakthroughs and blunders and ultimately ended up more dependent on his hackers than ever. The Lazarus Heist is an original podcast from the BBC World Service. I'm Jeff White. And I'm Jean Lee. Our producer is Viv Jones. Our original music was composed by Magnus Fines and E. Il Wu from the South Korean band Jambanai. And as ever, we'd love to hear your feedback. Keep leaving us those ratings and reviews. Let us know what you think of the season so far. And don't forget to follow or subscribe so you don't miss the next episode. And do also please spread the word on social media. We're using the hashtag Lazarus Heist. Thanks for listening.